Did you bring your copy of God's Word? Uh, would you, if you did, would you turn with me uh, to Romans chapter 8? Romans chapter 8, it's the second half of your Bible in what we call the New Testament. You got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels, and you got Acts of the Holy Spirit. And then you've got the book of Romans, Paul's letter to the church that was meeting in Rome in the first century. Uh, an incredible book. Uh, if you don't have your copy of God's Word, we'll have it on the Sky Bible here in just a second, okay? All right, well, we live, we live in a world that is cursed by sin. You know that. We see brokenness all around us. It's everywhere we look. Now, in the grand scheme of things, in light of eternity, this brokenness and this uh, uh, curse is only temporary. Romans 8, 22, uh, in this same chapter that we're in, verse 22 says that the, the all of creation is groaning, just longing for Jesus to return and right all the wrongs once and for all. We look forward to that return very, very soon. But in the meantime, in the meantime, we are citizens of God's kingdom living here as Christ ambassadors in the broken kingdoms of this earth. And while we're here, we are to represent the values and perspectives and principles that God wants us to model. Now, as a consequence of that sin, pain is a reality. Every one of us are very familiar with pain. It may be physical pain. The aches in your back or in your hips and thighs or whatever that's just evidence of a fallen world. It may be emotional pain, depression, and the disappointments of life are, are just evidence that we live in a fallen world. It may be relational pain, the hurt and the betrayal by someone that we trusted is just evidence that we live in a fallen world. It may be financial pain. Things break and need repairing, and the surprises of expenses when we weren't expecting them are just evidence of the fallen world in which we live. It may even be spiritual pain. We've sought the Lord for certain things, but so far it doesn't seem like he's heard us. There it is, yet again, evidence of a fallen world. Whatever pain you might be going through, it is real. There is no denying it. The past two years of this pandemic hasn't helped. It's only magnified a lot of people's pain. The Apostle Paul, the one who wrote this epistle to Rome, the Apostle Paul was very familiar with pain. He wrote a lot about pain. In fact, we could consider Paul a pain management specialist. Not in the physical sense like your medical practitioner, but certainly in a spiritual sense. And we can see from the letters that Paul wrote to the churches that Paul experienced a lot of pain. He suffered a lot in various ways, in all those ways. But his position about pain from God's heavenly perspective is so refreshing. And so I want to bring a word of encouragement to you today. Are you ready to be encouraged? God's word is a source of encouragement to us. And so let's look at what Romans chapter 8 says. 
Let's look at what verse 28 says. Are you ready? Verse 28. We know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I'm so glad that you chose today to be here. God's going to speak to us. God's going to speak to us. Let's pray together. Jesus, I ask that you would open our eyes today and help us to see clearly that everything that's happening in our lives is for a purpose. Help us to see it from a divine perspective, not through our broken lenses. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, let's break this verse down, verse 28. Let's break it down phrase by phrase, and let's see what the Holy Spirit wanted us to know. It begins by saying, we know that God causes everything. But there's not a period there. That's only mid-sentence. It keeps going. The thought continues to develop. Because we know that God does not cause everything. God doesn't cause cancer. That is definitely a product of the fall. God doesn't cause mental illness. He doesn't cause betrayal. He doesn't cause child abuse. He doesn't cause loss. He doesn't cause those things. Those are evidence of the fall. I want us to look at what the rest of the sentence says, okay? We know that God causes everything to work together for the good. It all works together for the good. God is a miracle-working God. Miraculous. He is able to take all those bad things that happen to us from time to time in this cursed world and bring about the ultimate good for our lives. That's just what God does. A, a great example is this. It, he, it happened to himself. It happened to himself. The, the, when uh, the crucifixion, the crucifixion of his one and only morally perfect son was the most excruciating thing that could ever happen to God. It was, the most, it was the worst thing that could ever happen in this world, in all of creation, to God's heart. It was absolutely the worst and most painful thing that could happen. Infinitely painful, more than what we would ever experience. And yet, out of that comes the salvation of us from, eter from eternal death and the hope of eternal life. The most beautiful thing that we can embrace and will embrace throughout all of eternity came out of the most painful thing that ever happened to God. If it happened to God, then it happens to us. Not because we're God, but because he sets the pace. So, we know that God causes everything to work together for the good. Does that happen for everybody? No. Let's continue to read. God does this process for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Let me ask you this question. How many of you love God? Can I just see your hands? Okay, hold them up. Hold them up. That, that's good. Man, I feel right at home here. All right, hold them up. Keep up. How many of you feel called according to God's purposes? You feel that? Okay, then this word is for you. <laughs> this is for you. I'm glad you came today. I'm glad you're tuning in today. This is for you. Not for everybody else, but if you raise your hand, it's got your name on it. God is a miracle working God. He can take the worst things that have ever happened to us and bring something, somehow bring something ultimately good out of it. Pain always has a divine purpose. 
Pain always has a divine purpose. But we have to consent to allowing God to transform all of that pain and use it for his purposes. We have to make certain choices so that we can benefit the most from what God has allowed. You see, God has three different purposes for the pain in our life. Three different purposes. No matter what kind of pain you might be going through right now, you would be better prepared to handle it if you could just understand what those purposes are in God allowing it. And so I just want to invite you today. to Let's just make up our mind now. We want to reach out and embrace those three benefits in our lives, why God allows the pain to exist in our lives. And if you make the right choices, we're going to make that choice today. When we leave here today, I'm going to give you an opportunity to make a deliberate choice to allow whatever is occurring to not be wasted, to allow whatever is occurring to benefit. See, God has three purposes for pain and it's, and it's all lined up for the three purposes that God has in our life. There are three purposes why God gives you breath, why you have a brainwave, why God's allowing your heart to continue to beat. There are three reasons why God has you here and right now. Those three purposes are contained in all the verbs of the great commandment and the great commission. Those three uh, purposes uh, Jesus prayed over them for us in John 17. Those three purposes are modeled for us in Acts chapter 2. Those three purposes of life are, are explained in detail in Ephesians chapter 4. In fact, all through Scripture, those three purposes just keep on coming back as a theme. There's a reason we're here. The first purpose, God's first purpose for your life is to encounter Jesus. That's why you're here. If you're taking notes, write that down. God's first purpose for my life is to encounter Jesus. You see, Jesus is the ultimate lover. Jesus is the ultimate lover, but he has to have an object of that affection, and we are the object of that affection. And so if Jesus is the infinite lover the ultimate lover, and we are his object of that affection, then, then it is prudent for us to respond to that affection, to respond to that love. That's what Jesus is looking for. Jesus does not want us just to know him casually. Jesus wants us to encounter him intimately. That is why he gives us breath, so that we could respond to him to his love. God's second purpose for our life is to encourage others. To encourage each other. That's the second purpose that God has for our existence. To encourage each other. We don't exist in a vacuum. God has put us here on this planet not to be loners, that's not why God put us here. We are designed to interact with each other. We are all like those little Lego pieces that all have little connectors and, and, and receptors. We have psychological connectors and recept receptors in our lives, just like a Lego piece is never designed to be played with by itself. We are better together. We're better together. And there's, there's, there, that's, that synergy is the power that occurs when people work together instead of apart. When people act together instead of apart. We're not just believers. We are belongers. That's what God has called us to do. That's our purpose. When we interact regularly with each other, we grow in Jesus. When we grow in Jesus, that's the definition of discipleship. And that's God's purpose for our life. God wants us, number one, to encounter him. Number two, God wants us to encourage each other. There's a third purpose for our life. God's third purpose for your life is to engage 
the world. To engage the world. That's the reason why you are here. God did not just place you here on this earth to suck air for a while and then to pass on. That's not why you're here, okay? He placed you here on this planet for a short season to make an impact. That's why you're here. God is expecting you to leave this world in a better place than the way you found it. But our legacy is not going to be from our ingenuity of our projects. Our legacy is going to be from the impact upon the people. That's what God has called us to do. And so you need to ask yourself, what contribution am I making with the skills that God has given me? Three purposes of life. That's nothing new so far. You hear us talk about that all the time. It was even in the church news a little earlier. Uh, all I've said up to this point is redundant. We've said it over and over and over the last 20 years. That's all review. You know all that stuff. But what you may not have realized, what you may not have realized is that God uses pain to develop those purposes in greater ways. We're going to see that truth today. Now, sadly, a lot of people don't realize that truth. And so they end up squandering their suffering. They don't profit from their problems. They don't learn from their losses. They don't harvest their hurts. They don't improve upon their injuries. They don't advance from their adversity. They don't gain from their pain. So that's why, God, that's why Paul asked in Galatians chapter 3, he says, Have you experienced so much for nothing? <laughs> Surely it was not in vain, was it? In other words, don't waste your pain. Don't waste your hurts. Let them be transformed into why God has allowed it so that we can maximize our purposes here on earth. We live in a broken planet, racked by sin. Pain is inevitable. The question is, are you going to waste it or are you going to win from it? Are you going to grow bitter or are you going to grow better? That's the question. There are three ways that you can benefit from the pain that you feel in your life. Three ways you can benefit. Whatever kind of pain it is, physical, emotional, relational, financial, spiritual, whatever kind it is, if you just make the right choices, then you can benefit from what God has allowed. It doesn't have to go wasted. Three choices you can make, three actions that you can take, and they all line up with the purposes of why we're here, the three purposes, you can transform your pain into purpose. Let me say that again. You can transform your pain into purpose. Let's look at those three actions, those three choices, those three ways that we can do that today, all right? Number one. I can use my pain to encounter Jesus closer. I can use my pain to encounter Jesus closer. Can I just tell you something? Whenever anything happens in life, whenever any disaster occurs, uh, you have a choice. You can either run to God or you can run from God. And, and from my observation of just interacting with people, it's about 50-50. Whenever disaster occurs, about half the people of the world run to God and the other half run from God. <laughs> just is the way it is. I, I just want to tell you, I've spent more quality time with Jesus in the last seven years than I ever did previously. The last seven years have been absolutely transformative in my life. I feel closer to Jesus today than I ever have before, and it's been a journey for the last seven years. Why seven years? Why not ten? Why not two? Well, about seven years ago, uh, we had some, some really, Pam and I, 
some of our closest friends to us uh, decided to believe uh, a lie that someone was circulating about us. It was not true, and, and, and they walked out of our life. And, and it was painful. Uh, I mentioned Pam. Pam is not here this morning. Pam is uh, ministering at our Kingsway location today. She wanted to be here, but, but uh, uh, anyway, those, those folks walked out of our lives. It was painful. That was seven years ago. Then three years ago, my mom uh, immediately, just suddenly passed away. It was unexpected. We weren't ready for it. She just, uh, in her sleep, she passed away. My dad woke up, and she was gone. And, and, and that was more pain than I thought I could bear. It was extremely painful. And then last year, many of you know what happened. Last year, about this time, I suffered a cardiac arrest, was in a coma for six days, took about three grueling months of recovery, and, uh, and it was just a lot more pain. All of those dreadful experiences were wake-up calls that shook my entire world. Just a little window into my life. But I want to tell you something. As sure as I'm standing here, each and every time I chose, I deliberately got up in the morning and made a choice, I will run to God. I ran to God. Every single day I had to wake up, I chose to cling to Jesus. I chose to hotly pursue after Jesus. Despite what I was feeling, despite the anger and the frustration, the confusion, the questions, I just said, Jesus, I'm pursuing you. And I can honestly say that I, I, as I can stand here today, I can embrace what God allowed because it took me closer to him. I can feel his heartbeat as I lean my ear on his chest. I can feel it. I, I, and, and, and my encounter with Jesus is much deeper now because I chose to go deeper. God allowed it and then wooed me to come closer to him. In pain, we can draw closer to Jesus and encounter him in a much deeper way than we ever did before. Paul gives us a model of authenticity in, in our encounter with Jesus. Look at this in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. We'll spend quite a bit of time in 2 Corinthians today. 2 Corinthians 1 says, We were crushed and overwhelmed by our ability to endure. Beyond our ability to endure. And we thought we would never live through it. Sound familiar? In fact, we expected to die. But as a result, <laughs> but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and we learned to rely on God. Now that will preach. That's the place where God wants us to finally land. God-reliance, not self-reliance. That's where God wants us to land. You know, uh, I told you that experience last year took me deeper in encountering Jesus. But can I just tell you, it was, it was even more painful for my wife and for my kids. Very painful. They lived these, I mean, it was two weeks of uncertainty what's going to happen to my husband what's going to happen to dad we don't know six days in a coma we don't know uh but you know what we have videos they've been posted on facebook different places we have videos of them worshiping and praying every single night in each other's homes when when the tragedy occurred they ran to jesus they didn't run from jesus and they didn't understand that what was happening. They didn't understand why it was allowed. But they determined that we are going to let this transform our lives and draw closer to Jesus and deeper into Jesus, not away from him. It is a fact. When you are hurting, your prayers are more real. It's a fact. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 7, Look at this. The pain caused you to repent and change your ways. I want to tell you something. Pain will always cause you to alter your course and get on a better track if you will just tune in and understand it and realize it and capitalize upon it. Two verses later, Paul continues. 
verse 11, isn't it wonderful all the ways in which this distress has goaded you closer to God? Can you see that? What an oxymoron. When have you ever seen wonderful and the distress in the same sentence? But look at the result. It goads us closer to God. You're more alive, more concerned, more sensitive, more reverent, more human, more passionate, more responsible. Look at from any looked at from any angle, you've come out of this with purity of heart. Wow. Notice those eight qualities that are mentioned there. From alive to purity of heart. Eight qualities. Eight virtues of life. That God wants to use your pain to achieve in a greater way. It's just how God uses to develop it. Pain will always transform our lives to the better if we will just allow God to do his work. Look at this. Look at this. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 8. Even though Jesus was God's son, he learned obedience from the things he suffered. If Jesus learned obedience from suffering, then how do you think you're going to learn obedience? There's only one, only certain things, there's certain things that we can only learn from our pain. There's no other way. If it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. Jesus, I want to learn from what you're allowing. I want to transform it to a deeper purpose. So what's the first thing that God invites us to do when we experience pain? What's the first thing? To run to him, not away from him. To choose to encounter him even deeper. To choose to allow him to fashion us to be more into his image and a lot less the way we were when we were born. That's the first reason. Here's the second reason. The first reason is I can choose to allow my pain to encounter Jesus closer. Number two, I can choose, I can use my pain to encourage others better. I can, I can use my pain to encourage others better. If you will allow it, if you will allow it, Pain will deepen and mature your love for other people. Did you know that pain has a way of sensitizing us to other people? Pain has a way of turning self-centered people into sympathetic people. Proverbs 20 says, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. That line is so true. Whatever, wh when everything's going great, when everything's going great, we, we have a tendency to coast and become comfortable. But when something painful occurs, it arrests us, it stops us in our tracks, and we have to reassess what's, what's going on in life. And, and, and in, in that way, God uses it to get our attention. Since our friends left us seven years ago, I want to just tell you, the dy dynamics on our staff have been incredibly magical, deep, 
wonderful. The experience that you were able to witness a few minutes ago when we were here to begin our honor process of Harold and Margaret is just a tip of the iceberg of, of the dynamics that's going on on our team here at this church. When my mom passed away three years ago, my dad and I started a journey together that took us so much deeper into each other. I'm so much closer to my dad today than I've ever been in my life. The cardiac arrest that I suffered last year, our family has never been closer now. We, we're in each other's homes every Sunday night, except when we have a connect group or something. Uh, it's just magical, but it's also made us closer to other people. You see, we're more sensitive to other people now. We, in conversations, we lean in. We're listening better. We're more sensitive to others. Before, we were so busy with our lives and running fast and just kind of passing each other in parallel, but, but last year was an arresting moment and it stopped us in our tracks we reassessed our priorities and have a much greater appreciation now of of the brevity and the fragility of life spending much more time now in our people interactions and less time on our projects what a joy I'm so glad god has done this deep work in our lives the deepest level of love always shows up after someone has experienced pain if we will allow it so what is our choice we suffer pain we choose to draw closer to other people and when we do we give and receive encouragement in a much more authentic way but it's a deliberate choice your pain can either be a stepping stone or a stumbling block which is it going to be we can either lead into other people or we can withdraw from other people which is it going to be we can either grow better or we can grow bitter we have a choice we deliberately choose to allow our pain to draw us closer to others there's a third purpose we can use our pain to encounter Jesus closer we can use our pain to encourage others better third thing is we can use our pain to engage our world further we can use our pain to gain to incur to encounter <laughs> gonna get it right now engage the world further as I said, pain sensitizes us to other people. No matter what painful experience you might be going through right now, there's other people that are experiencing worse. <laughs> there's other people going through much worse things. But as a follower of Jesus, Jesus wants us to redeem our pain. He wants us to redeem our suffering. How? Because he wants us to use our pain to benefit others. It's right in Scripture. I want you to look at this verse, 2 Corinthians. I told you Paul was a specialist. 2 Corinthians 1. We've been in 2 Corinthians all morning here. Look at this. God comforts us in all our troubles. How much of our troubles? God comforts us in all our troubles. Why? So that he could spoil us? So that he could insulate us from the realities of life? Why does God comfort us but allow all the troubles? So that we can comfort others. Right there. That's it. So that we can comfort others. When they are troubled we will be able to give them the same comfort that God has given us. So as we 
as God allows us to experience a measure of pain, and as we, from our perspective, are able to translate that and to capitalize upon it and to, and to draw closer to him and to receive comfort from him, then we can take that experience, and as we encounter other people who are confused and, and growing bitter from their experiences, we can say, oh, let us show you another, another angle. Let us give you perspective. Let us minister to you. We're going to bring comfort to you the same way God is bringing comfort to us. Wow. Whatever you might be going through right now, God is allowing it so that you can reach others and impact others, comfort others. But we have to to decide, will I allow God to use me that way? Will I give God consent to use me that way? Who can better help an alcoholic than someone who used to be an alcoholic themselves? Who can better help someone going through the pain of divorce than someone who has already been through the pain of divorce themselves? Who can better help someone grieving the loss of a loved one than one who has already grieved the loss of a loved one themselves? God does not want to you to waste your pain. We live in a hurting world. We're surrounded by hurting people. And they can't necessarily hear God because he speaks in a still, small voice. But God wants to use us to bring healing and to bring comfort to them. And to apply the healing ointment to their wounds. The very thing that you hate the most about your life experience is the very thing that God wants to use the most to expand your ministry. Will you allow that truth to emerge from your life? You see, we tend to think that that we can help people most by our strengths. We tend to think that we can help people most by our successes. But God has a way of always flipping things upside down. It's counterintuitive. Did you know that we help people most out of our weakness and out of our brokenness, out of our failures? God wants to take your deepest hurt and turn it into your greatest ministry. The world's not impressed by how much you enjoy your prosperity. The world will be most impressed by how you handle your adversity. We think God can use our successes and our strengths, but it's actually it's actually the other way around it's the other way around we think that our success is what brings us our credibility no no it's our suffering that builds character and then our character is what builds our credibility We think, well, fame is going to earn my respect. No, it's actually faithfulness during tough times that earns people's respect. Paul was such a pro at using pain to engage the world. Look at what it says in in Philippians chapter 1. Philippians 1, I want you to know that everything that has happened to me here has helped me 
spread the good news. What a perspective. What a perspective. All those negative things, all the, the, the slashings and cursings and beatings and, and, and shipwrecks and starving and, and, and all the trials, the betrayals. I want you to know that everything that's happened to me here has helped me spread the good news. What was the context for Paul to say these words? This letter to the church in Philippi is considered the prison epistles, the section of the New Testament that's the prison epistles. Paul wasn't riding on his high horse when he wrote these words. When Paul wrote these words, when Paul wrote these words of how God is using his pain to further engage the world, Paul was languishing in a dark, grimy, Roman dungeon, chained in stocks, sitting on death row, awaiting the imminent martyrdom. That's when Paul wrote these words. Your deepest life message is going to come out of your deepest life pain. But you have to choose to allow it to be translated. Don't waste it. Don't waste your pain. There are people all around you right now who need you. They, you have, have a purpose, and your pain will only serve to deepen that purpose. Are you with me? You can waste your pain, or you can translate your pain for a greater purpose. It's your choice. We have to decide to do that. Well, I'd like to give you an assignment. <laughs> Do you feel like you've come to school today? Are you ready for some homework? I'm going to give you some homework. I want you, to, I want you to do this. I want you to name your pain. Name it. Just in your mind right now, not out loud. We don't need to know. The person next to you doesn't need to know. But I want you right now, name your pain. Call it out. Name it. Call it by name. If it's a person, if it's a situation, if it's an instance, whatever it is. What is that painful experience in your life? And here's what I want you to do. Somewhere, whether it's a back of an envelope in the seat pocket in front of you or on a piece of paper at home or, or whatever, I want you to write that down. Would you just write it down before the day is over? Actually, do this before you go to lunch. You don't want to forget what we've experienced today by after lunch. Write it down and, and put that in your Bible. Write, name your pain, write it down, put it in your Bible, somewhere safe. And with this three-step grid that I've given you this morning, I want you to determine that you are going to use that pain for God's purposes. I refuse to waste this. God, you've allowed it. And I'm going to stop shaking my fist at you, God. And I'm going to try to find a grace to embrace this. I've named it. I've written it down. And now I want to walk through the grid. Jesus, I want to draw closer to you and encounter you closer. I want to use this to encourage others around me. I want to use this to engage my world. going to happen anyway. I want to translate this for the most good. Will you use your pain to encounter Jesus closer? Will you use your pain to encourage others
Would you use your pain to engage your world further? I'd like to invite you, if you would, to stand with me. We're going to close now. It's a tender moment. I'm so glad that we're in a, in a phase now in our country where we're starting to open back up and in doing so, we're able to open our altars back up and to agree in prayer with people. And I'd like to right now invite our prayer team, if you'd come down and just be prepared to serve people that, that need to be served. Would you come now? Thank you. Thank you for your voluntary service. Thank you for your faithfulness. How many of you would say, Mark, I'm going to do what you said. I'm going to, I'm going to name my pain. And I'm going to translate that for God's good, God's purposes. Can I see your hand? Look around. I want to use my pain to, for God's purposes. Isn't that good? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for your honesty. Thank you. We're going to use it for God's purposes. Can we just bow our heads in prayer? I want to pray for you. Lord Jesus. Thank you for my friends who are here. Thank you for those that are tuning in online who I've never met. Thank you. And God, I just ask that you right now your grace would just billow on the people's lives. We're so much pain in this house. And God, I just ask that you would just uh, use these experiences to extend their ministry, to be a blessing to others. God, we just thank you. Thank you for your grace. Minister to my friends. Now with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to ask one more thing. A bunch of us raised our hand a while ago. We're a hand-raising church. <laughs> Raise it during worship. Raise it when the pastor asks a question. I have one more question to ask. If you are not in the right proximity to Jesus. There's a chasm between you. You know about Jesus, but you don't know him intimately, and you would like to really know Jesus intimately. You want to, nothing between you. You want the, all the things you've done wrong, separated, that separate you. You want all that gone. You would like to be on the same wavelength with Jesus, relationship with Jesus. If you want that, I want to close in prayer in just a minute. I'd like to know who I'm praying for. If you would like to say, Mark, I'm going to close. I want to pray the prayer you're going to pray. I would like to be reconciled to Jesus. I want to have a relationship, a vibrant relationship with Jesus. If that's you, can I just see you raise your hand real quick up and down? I'm just going to close in prayer and we're going to pray. Thank you. Thank you back there. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah. Thank you. Bless you, Jesus. I want a relationship with Jesus. When you pray, would you lead me in that prayer? Thank you, ma'am. I see you. Thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Jesus. Yes. Bless you. Hallelujah. Can we all pray together so these folks don't feel singled out? Let's all pray this prayer together. Lord Jesus, Lord Jesus. I admit that I've done things wrong. And those things separate you from me. I want to fix that today. I believe in your love. I believe in your grace. I believe in your mercy. I believe in your mercy. And I ask you to forgive me. And I ask you to forgive me. I confess what I've done wrong. I confess what I've done wrong. Cleanse me. Cleanse me. Remove it from me. Remove it from me. Give me a fresh start. Give me a fresh start. And I decide. And I decide to follow you. To follow you. The rest of my life. The rest of my life. In Jesus name. In Jesus name. Amen.